So I met Alicia has put together a rock star speaker list and we expect everybody to be inspired and we're so happy that you're here with us. Quickly, I just also want to give a special shout out to our two sponsors, Welcome in well, uh, Women in Soccer and Goal 5. Uh, women in Soccer, you must, must, must join their membership. It's totally free. It will expand your soccer opportunities and your soccer network. So definitely go become a member. And stay tuned because every single session, Goal 5 is going to give out a prize for one lucky attendee. Their apparel is for her, it's beautiful. And um, they have been generous enough to support our conference by giving out a wonderful, wonderful t-shirt to one lucky winner. So thank you all so much for being here. And we hope that you're inspired. We hope that you join, we hope that you spread the word um, and we hope that you support America Sports Bay Area. Thank you so much. And I'll turn it over to our lovely speakers. Right. Well, thanks, Angela. Um, I would like to introduce our two um, speakers that are going to kick us off for the Building, Empowering, Strengthening Women and Girls in through Soccer. First, we have Luis Arsenault, and then we have Janae Sunseri Rapp. So I'm going to let you guys introduce yourselves and take it from there. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks. Um, I'll go first, Jay. My name is Louise Arsenault. I'm from New Brunswick, Canada. Like I mentioned earlier, I'm going to show you guys a little bit where that's at on the map. Um, just a little bit of background on me. I grew up in Canada, went to a French high school, and then graduated, went to English University in Alabama, did my master's in Mississippi, um, played WPSL six seasons and three seasons in the W League. I played professionally in Finland as well and played some futsal and now I've transitioned to beach soccer. And this is what we'll be chatting um, about today about the different forms of the sport and we're super excited. So thanks for having us. Hey everyone, my name is Janae Sanceri Warp. Uh, I am based, like I said earlier, out in California. Um, born and raised, never left. I clearly like it. I like the weather here in California. Uh, played at San Jose State and uh, played a little semi after, dabbled a little bit in other forms of soccer for a little bit, jumped into bodybuilding for a hot minute, uh, <laughs> just to give myself an extra challenge. Um, and then more in the recent years, uh, stumbled into uh, beach soccer, of course, futsal as well. Um, I have two awesome little kids and uh, I'm super excited and honored to be here today. Thank you both. Um, Louis, Alou, why don't we start with you? And um, how did you get into soccer and, and how that got you to where you are now in um, beach soccer? Oh man, that's a, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, so I got into soccer when I was really little. I was about five years old. My parents put me in there um, as like a cost-effective sport. Here in Canada, as most of you know, it's hockey. Um, so it's cost-effective sport. I was somebody that tended to be pretty fast. So I decided to, my parents put me in, fell in love with the sport um, and never gave it up since. So for me, just kept playing it, kept playing, kept playing, had different opportunities, took those opportunities, um, was recruited into college, university and then played out that out there. And then we're gonna discuss, I think a little bit more about our tris transition into futsal and to beach a little bit later, but essentially speaking, um, I just couldn't give it up. I love it. I love playing. I love what it brings. I love the value that it brings and um, the camaraderie. So that's kind of how I got into it. How old were you when you started? Five. Five. Yeah. Oh my goodness. All right. <laughs> And Janae, actually, how about you? I was actually the same age. I started at five, but I'm a little older than Lou. So <laughs> I feel like I've been playing a little bit longer than you. No. Um, so I started at age five as well, which just might be just the age you kind of start playing. You know, everyone says that they started like a little earlier, three, but, you know, <laughs> we know that the real <laughs> part doesn't start until later. That's right. Um, for me, it wasn't, you know, choosing between different sports. I, I'm one of five, so I'm the youngest. And... I had too much energy and my parents were just like, get her in something, let her run. And, and soccer, as we know, you run a lot. Um, and at a little age, you're just like, little, you know, uh, pods running around the field. So um, for me, sport, I played a handful of other sports as well. And we will probably talk about that a little bit later and in transitions into other sports and other forms. 
Um, but soccer was the sport that I always went back to. I played through high school. It was, you know, it's that sport that I spent extra time training on other than the other sports. And so I, that was just my home for me. Fabulous. Lou, do you want to uh, do your presentation and show us your evolution? And we'll get right into uh, the beach part of your soccer experience. Uh, sh sure. So, all right, just a little bit about me. Like I was telling you guys earlier, um, let me share my screen really quickly. All right, here we go. So as mentioned, America Scoresby area is out here where the smiley faces, but I actually live all the way up there in New Brunswick, Canada. And I'll just zoom it, give you guys a close up to as to where I live because I know not very many people have heard to of actually Dunlop, New Brunswick, Canada. So I live up here and a lot of, if you don't know about this, there's a lot of snow. Um, we, I mean, two years ago, we had over 279 inches of snow. Uh, we get temperatures that go down to like minus 40 Fahrenheit. So minus 55 Celsius, like it's pretty brutal during our winters. Um, so it was interesting for me because how does a Canadian player that grew up in Canada in such weather become a beach soccer player? So I wanted to share with you guys a little bit of my transition um, as I grew into that. And here's what I want to bring a value to you too. A lot of times when we state stuff like, so we are, our, our human nature is to answer questions. We are geared to answer questions. For instance, if I just go ahead and I say, don't answer verbally, but if you answer in your head, if I say, am I wearing a blue jacket? Is the sky blue? Um, is there snow on the ground where you're at? So your brain is automatically answering these questions. So for me, instead of saying, you know, I had the opportunity to go play beach soccer, um, the location that they shared was Turkey. So I wanted to go, but how do you do that when you're in an environment where you have so much snow on the ground, a lot of hard weather, that kind of thing. So by being, um, answer seeking beings, instead of saying, this is impossible for me, which is a statement and accepting it as is. Um, I started, and if you say this, why is this impossible for me? If you say things like that, your brain is going to go, well, there's a reason why this is impossible for you. And it's going to list all these answers. So for me, I started asking myself a different question, which was how could I make this possible? How could I be in Canada right now and train and actually get to compete at a higher level um, on the beach? So when I asked myself those questions, I want to share with you guys some of the answers that I came up with. So here is a little bit of my story in a nutshell, about one minute condensed. So I hope you guys enjoy. Do you have audio with this? No, it's okay. Okay, great. And I'll tell you guys a little bit more in a minute, like what we had to do. All right. So one of the questions, like I said, that I asked myself was, how can I make this possible? And I remember uh, my parents and I would go to eat like all the con the convenience, store, not the convenience stores, the hardware stores looking for, first of all, we're looking for, you know, those turtle shaped um, sandboxes for kids. That's actually what we're looking for at first. Cause I was like, at least I'll be able to train in that. And of course it's, you know, January <laughs> and nobody can find those. So we're like, okay, so what else is our option? And we were looking for bags of sand and those were not available either. So, um, as you saw in the video, so my parents and I were like, okay, how can we problem solve this? They were a good help with me uh, in solving this problem, but we have a local cement shop here where they like mix sand with, um, to, to create cement. And we're like, Hey, how about we, you know, go out there and ask if we can buy some of the sand. And normally it's for like big manufacturers, big companies, but they, they let us actually purchase dirt sand. So I remember my dad and I having to back the truck up to these mountains and like breaking 
the the first layer of ice off of that sand thing and then filling up our buckets and obviously my dad helped me build the sandbox in which um, I trained but Janae was a big part of this because I would send her some of my videos and like how's my technique you know I'll like I'm new at this help me out and she would give me feedback and pointers which was kind of neat so she she played a really big role into like where I was able to go and like now we're teammates of course but um so that was a little bit of my story on, on this part and then obviously oops and then obviously um here's some more pictures there's some pictures of like I had to train in the snow and as I was mentioning you're looking like below weather so to problem solve on this one I remember having like a hot bucket of water next to the sand my sandbox so that way like when my feet would freeze I would hop in there warm my feet up dry them off and then hop back in the sand so I could train and then I would have my parents like you know they were all dressed and bundled and they would like toss the ball over and I would like learn how to like control it and send it back to them, they would return them all. Um, and then one of the other things too, that I was like, what could I mimic? What could I, what can I recreate that would create some of the same resistance that soccer gives you or lack thereof? And then I was like, well, the snow, okay. How do you use the snow without freezing? So I would actually run in the snow to create some resistance as if it was the sand. So that was like another way for me to like, I would train. Those were some of the trainings that I would do. Um, and last but not least, <laughs> Janae was telling me that it was important to learn how to do bicycle kicks. And it was something that I struggled with, but okay, how do you do that with shoes on or big boots on? That didn't work. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Skinner's socks. They're socks that has like the sole of it. It's kind of like a bit of a rubber. Um, and I, I taped that to my snow pants and I would, that would enable me to go 15 minutes in the, the snow without freezing. And I would actually practice um, my bicycle kicks that way in order to just kind of get to training. Um, and like that training there, the stuff that I've done in the back, background is what helped lead me into Turkey in October. So I was able to train, uh, I think it was like, what was it, Jay? Like four months, four, four yep. months in the snow or something like that. And then all of a sudden, um, NorCal Beach women got to go play in Turkey. Um, that's her team up there on the left. And yeah, that's a little bit of my story in a nutshell. So that's just some social media stuff, but yeah that was one of the best bicycle kicks i've ever seen oh god yeah <laughs> no 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 like that <laughs> to a lame uh, to a lay woman yes <laughs> well thank you cool. i appreciate it i still have ways to go but thank you um janae do you want to give a little bit about your background and um uh, yeah. soccer yeah so um first of all lou's presentation is it's missing so much. Uh, and, and I know we don't have time for it probably today, but your journey, like Lou is a perfect example of someone starting a sport like myself later on in our soccer careers. You know, we played grass and dabbled in, you know, maybe it's futsal and indoor, but uh, the transition from that hard surface to the sand and what like what went into that and we'll probably get into it at some point in this conversation, but that transition, I think for Lou, and then, you know, meeting Lou here in the States, and then she went right back home when she first got introduced to beach and then went back home and had to learn it on her own. Uh, it, it's just sheer, sheer determination of wanting to learn the sport and get into it. So um, Lou's a little bit of a badass. So <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. So, so for me, just, you know, I don't have a... a a presentation as far as like my journey map, but I have a few photos that I can share in a little bit. But for me, you know, I said, mentioned earlier, I, I played soccer my whole life. I played some other sports. Um, I played field hockey in high school. I played softball. I lettered all of the sports and I, I just was, and just a typical average athlete. I felt um, when I was five years old, I remember writing uh, like a letter to your future self. And I'm sure a lot of you remember doing that. Like you write this letter to your future self and you're like, when I grow up, I want to be whatever. And mine said, I want to be a professional athlete. You know, I had people that I looked up to when I was younger. Um, Julie Fowdy was one of my faves. And I wrote that note, sealed it. it. I don't even know where it went for a while, but my mom, the hoarder she is, she, she gave me a box many years later and was like, here's your box of <laughs> crap from, from the storage. Do you want it? And it was like literally old jerseys, um, old cleats, like the, the, the old Adidas cleats. And like, they just like flopped open. The sole was just like, like an alligator. 
But um, in that box was this letter to myself, to my future self. And I was like in my 20s, I think, when I opened it. And I remember opening it. At the time, I was just I was just playing indoor soccer. Um, I played with the Nighthawks for a little bit. Um, I was working in a health industry, um, doing sales. And so I was not on that track to become a professional <laughs> soccer player by no means. But I opened that letter and I read it and I <laughs> kind of giggled and I was like, this is crazy. And I threw it away. Like, it was just like, that's silly that I even had that dream when I was little. Um, and it wasn't until... I really dabbled in uh, bodybuilding at the time. Um, I was done with college. I um, kind of didn't really know what I was doing with myself because soccer was my life. And then after college, it kind of was falling short. Um, it, at, at the time I was done with college, it was the time that the pro league kind of had collapsed. And so a lot of those pro athletes were coming to the semi-pro level. Um, the, the teams were really uneven. It was just not great quality level play. Um, a lot of players lost interest and I was one of them. So fast forward, did bodybuilding. Bodybuilding for me was just a way for me to challenge myself, um, for me to take back that control that I had with soccer um, and I did it for a few years and I did, I didn't do too bad. Um, but I put myself in bodybuilding just to see if I could take myself from point A to Z and see what my body transformation would look like. And so that I think was the sport that kind of, um, ignited that, like that spark of like, I need a challenge again. I need to get back into something. So got back into soccer, 11 aside Sunday league, <laughs> um, and it wasn't until a friend of mine um, who I was playing indoor with at the time, Luisa Meza, she's like, come out, play beach soccer. We have a tournament in Santa Cruz. It's, it was like a pro AM uh, ran tournament. Uh, just come out and play. And I literally, no joke, was like, what is beach soccer? Never heard of it. Are we like, what kind of ball are we playing with? Do we wear cleats? Like I was, I, I really didn't know what the sport was gave it a shot, went out, had fun, had some beers after. It was really a very relaxed environment, not very serious. Um, and that was really the moments of like getting into a brand new sport, being challenged in, uh, in a terrain that's not stable in any way. Um, but what I loved about it and why I caught the bug like right away was being able to throw my body, being able to get creative because the minute that ball hits the ground, you don't know where that ball's going on the grass on the turf and, you know, indoor, um, in futsal, the ball's bouncing. You, you can predict where the bounces are. You can, you know, when you're landing, you know, how you're landing, um, your body's preparing itself in the sand. It was very different. It was very challenging. So that's when I caught the bug. Um, I'll show a few pictures uh, for beach soccer, but I'm sure we're going to get into a little bit more um, in here in a minute. But um, I, I'll share a few things. Um, so when I started playing beach soccer, I actually uh, wasn't playing futsal. So futsal was another sport that was another form of soccer that was really new to me. Um, I had an opportunity fairly quickly after I started learning beach soccer, um, met, uh, Roxy Kamal, who was running us futsal at the time. She's also running gamer, uh, gamer futsal Academy for youth, for, um, for young girls and phenomenal program. And that opened my eyes up to what futsal was about, um, the speed of the sport, but in actually futsal and beach are really similar. It's smaller fields. It's less people on the field. Um, and it's actually your interaction with the goalkeeper is even very different. Your interaction with the goalkeeper on sand. So it was such a unique sport. And I've had an opportunity to go play uh, with U.S. futsal. Um, and actually, uh, we, we were able to compete together with Lou um, as well. All right. So um, beach soccer. So a few pictures with beach soccer. So about 2017, we got an opportunity to go play um, in Portugal for what's called the Euro Winners Cup. And it's a big, massive professional tournament. It's, you know, heavy, heavy men's teams, right? And the women's side was fairly decent. And learning beach soccer for the first time, and 
in, we'll talk more about like how, like the journey to which get getting to the professional level, but in a nutshell, the Euro winner's cup for me was like the top of the top getting the opportunity. So through my journey with beach soccer has taken me to play with teams um, in Portugal under Madger, um, the sporting CP team, uh, along with my teammate, uh, Luisa, who introduced me the first time to beach soccer. But then I also got another opportunity the following year to go play with another team, the Rosas, uh, which was a Spanish team. Um, and that the year that we went, there was only four U.S. Uh, women players that have ever played in the Euro Winners Cup at the time. And so the players that the players and I, we felt like this is potentially an opportunity for us to open this up, like open it up for the women in the States, for young girls to have a path um, to another professional, um, up another professional level. Uh, so picture me after I, after I scored a goal in El Salvador with the U.S. <laughs> team. Um, this is my awesome team, um, uh, U.S. Women's Beach Soccer National Team. Uh, the team itself, full of amazing athletes, some athletes that hadn't played beach soccer before, um, so the sport itself does open its doors to people that haven't played. And if you have the determination and, and eagerness to, to try something new and push for the top, you know, beach soccer is, is, is a great avenue. Um, we had an opportunity. I'll, I'll show you this. We call her the flying <laughs> squirrel. <laughs> Whoa. So that video, I don't know if you guys heard the audio, right? No. Okay. So the audio on it, I was laughing because the audio is actually my husband taking a video of them watching it on TV and my kids are just like, yeah, like they're so excited. So for me as a mom, um, like such proud moments to be able to wear the crest and represent your country um, in a sport in the U.S. that is brand new. You know, you've got, you're following a really big and bright shadow of the women's US national team. And it's a really, it's actually a really cool shadow to follow. Um, but that comes with a lot of, um, you know, standards, high standards and what you need to uphold. And so um, for me wearing the crest now that it's a brand new team, it just, it really means a lot to me. Um, I know I spoke a lot, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop talking and pass it back. <laughs> no, it's super interesting. Um, one of the things when I was looking at the shots you must get sand everywhere in every <laughs> orifice of your body. <laughs> Beach soccer, it's, it is everywhere. You can take a shower every single day and you'll still find it. Um, I'm noticing now that I, I'll fall asleep at night after a training and I'll wake up in the middle of the night or the next morning and there's just like sand. <laughs> <laughs> the bottom and you'll find it in your ears yeah I mean, for sure yeah. you have to be okay with sand yeah right totally. um I'm curious do your kids play are they into soccer in any form or um yeah I would say yes and no my my daughter I have a seven and 11 year old my son was dabbling in soccer right before COVID right before the pandemic and he was really getting into it um, at a recreational level. And he just, he loves, I mean, the kids are, I think because they've been around it for so long, it's, it's one of those, like, yeah, my mom plays soccer, you know? Mm -hmm. And then it wasn't until, um, I made the national team and my son <laughs> Googled my name and he's like, Oh, you're, you're professional. <laughs> oh, you're <laughs> yeah. I, I now can say, you know, but, um, they to answer your question. They don't, but if I go out to the park to train, usually it's my daughter who um, yeah. will kick off her shoes and hop in the sand and Zoe's like, let's go, we're gonna sprint. What are we gonna do? You know, and she does not care for the, the sand can be anywhere. And she's like, she's good with it. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the reasons for this whole summit is the empowerment of girls and women. And obviously you both have shown that, that this is such, I, I mean, the confidence and self-esteem that you show when you're talking about this sport is so awesome. How can we get more girls in the sport, specifically beach? Because it sounds like 
I mean, I know it's really big here with Ty. Um, he's done a phenomenal job with the pro um, beach. Am. Pro AM. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But how, how, and how can we retain girls? Because there's always a drop off at age 13 that they stop playing. How can we keep them involved? Lou, go, go ahead and start with that because no. you're a coach too. Yeah, so that's, I think that's a two-part question. How do we keep them you know, involved in continuing in sports in general because girls are dropping off at the age of 13? I think we need to be able to create environments where you know, as the years have passed, we've put a lot of pressure on kids to be able to perform. And I think with that pressure to want to become better, which is good in a sense, there also comes a point where the kids stop having fun. And when that distinction happens, that's when players start to drop off the competitive level and they don't necessarily want to pursue it any further in high school and in college and forget, you know, any other sport um, or any other opportunity af after that. So if we create an environment like in coaching or essentially like as mentors or, um, you know, ambassadors of the sport where there are different avenues and we create an environment where there's growth centered and it becomes fun, then if you fall in love with a game at a young age and you continue nurturing that fire, players are gonna still keep going and growing. And I think that's the key to retraining players, not necessarily burning them out um, by the time that they're 10, but creating an environment where it's safe for them to make mistakes and to grow. And I think if we can really harness that as players um, and as coaches and as educators and as you know all the other amazing women that are on this panel, if we can continue putting that message out there to people that are direct influence of these kids, um, I think we'll be able to you know make leaps and bounds and strides into keeping and retaining young female athletes in the sport. Yeah, definitely. Well, do you think it's important then to have more women coaches, especially in beach soccer, since it's relatively new to kind of soccer fans? Um, and how can we get coaches to get out to beach soccer? Well, I'm going to go ahead and say that there just needs to be more women in the sport, period, <laughs> coaching. I'm just going to go ahead and put that out there. I mean, yes, bring us <laughs> on. Let's go. Um, so my opinion is going to be biased on that one. <laughs> But Jay, go ahead. You can answer this one. I, I was just going to say the same thing. I mean, <laughs> of course we want women empowerment, you know, absolutely. Um, I think to go back to your question though, I, let me answer this first question. Yeah. I think having, you know, female coaches is, is huge in any sport. It's not just soccer. Um, you know, on the national team, our, we have a, a male coach. He is amazing he is he is exactly what this team needs our our current team needs um and it's not that he caters to us any different than he would to the men's team because he's actually in a position right now where he's both the men's and women's uh u.s national coach right now and he is exactly what we need right now for for both of the teams um he pushes us past our what we think is our limits um, he thinks of the game in a different way and he knows how to speak to each individual player as if he would be speaking to each individual player on the men's team. Um, so should I say like, well, we need a women's coach? No, I, I, I think he's exactly what we need right now, but we definitely need more women, women, female coaches. Mm -hmm. uh, we need more presence. Uh, to go back to your question about how do we keep, how do we, you know, I mean, it's like creating pathways for the youth. Um, I can speak from my experience out of college, I kind of didn't really, I, I, I wasn't at the level that I needed to be to be at that top pro play, pro level at the time, you know? Um, later on in life, yeah, I think I probably could push for that level, but coming out of college, I wasn't there. I wasn't here in my mind. I was, you know, um, immature. You know, thinking back when I was in college, you know, we had psychology sessions, but now psychology sessions are way different. So the preparation of the right mental state for um, young athletes, it's, it's gotten better and it will, we will continue to grow. For, for having a pathway into beach soccer, I think now that there's a national team in the US, I think that is huge. It is yet another pathway for um, female athletes to, to reach for. And it's not to say, oh, I didn't make the grass 
you know, uh, and if there's ever a U.S. national team for futsal, then, you know, it's, it's, that could be another avenue as well. We have to continue to build awareness. We have to continue to educate. And Ty does a great job with education with the pro AM, you know, he sends out on social media, you know, how to flick the benefits of beach soccer. Um, you know, you've got gamer beach. That's a, that's a youth academy that'll start to spin back up once COVID's over. And you've got Cali beach, which is, uh, ran by two of our NorCal teammates. Um, so you start to see these uh, younger youth academies starting to spin up in beach soccer. And literally it's coaches from grass taking their players from the grass and putting them in the sand. And you'll start to see speed. You'll start to see endurance, uh, creativity, because they're forced into uh, an uncertain terrain. It's, you, you don't know where the ball's gonna bounce. You can throw your body up in the air and, and, try and, and try and hit a bike or a side volley, diving headers and land in sand versus hard surfaces. And so I think you, you start to see the kids ability when they go back and return to, to grass, they're quicker, they're, they're more agile. Um, I have a, um, a girl that's training with me right now safely. We, we keep our distance, but one of the girls that trains with me, she's in college. She was a Menlo, um, Shane Moran, I'm giving a shout out. Um, I don't think she's on this, <laughs> but, but, uh, she's, uh, she's a young athlete. She just started college and she's like, I want to just come train because she just wanted, she wanted to improve herself. She came from high school to college. And she's like, I just want to be better. I just want to, I want to be better. Um, so she's been training with me and some of my teammates in the sand. She comes in on Sundays and it's been a few months now. And she told me the other day, she's like, I am faster. I can juggle. She's like, I couldn't really juggle all that great before, but she's faster, quicker, more agile. Um, because we do drills where you're dribbling in the sand, you're dribbling and weaving it out of cones, you're cutting. So we have to bring more awareness to the sport. And there is an avenue, there is we have a national team now, which is amazing. Yeah. And I'm going to add on a little bit to that too, in terms of, I'm going to regress on in terms of having more women in the sport uh, coaching. I think the importance of having women in the sport coaching, especially at youth level, we're so used to having men, which they're doing a great job, but having a female, I think builds or creates a tangible link between where the, those kids are and like what they want to achieve or where they want to be, as opposed to just always being led by men and saying, oh yeah, I'm a man and I've played pro, which is great, but like they can't really relate to that. So having more females in the youth sport um, creates a, like a link of relatability. And these girls are like, oh, wow, then maybe it is possible for me. Maybe I can do that too, right? And I think that that's like super powerful in itself to just be able to kind of sow the seeds and help these players kind of grow and, you know, you know, mold them or help them achieve what they want to achieve. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, I was actually going to ask about obstacles, and we just got a question from Fred, who is um, watching. Uh, his youth teams um, used to play in the Virginia Beach North American Sands Soccer Championships, um, but it was only a single weekend each year. Um, so they never really get to train in the sand. And so what are some other ways, aside from building the elaborate um, frozen tundra that you have, Lou? Um, <laughs> so, you, you know, you can teach uh, sand skills to these teams that are usually practicing on grass. Jay? Um, I, Lou's got some great ideas because I actually go to Lou when I'm like, Hey, I need help with more juggling or I need, you know, Lou is a, Lou is my teammate. Um, on NorCal. So uh, just a quick shout out to NorCal. So NorCal is yeah. our, um, our club team. Uh, that's where we started. We started on NorCal. Um, it's a beach soccer team that came together a few years back, more than a few years back now. And we went to Tobago and we've traveled, um, and played together for, for a while now. And a few players came and go, but for the most part, the, the bulk of the team is still together. Um, so, uh, where was I going with that? Oh, so we've got, um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> I was going with the wear NorCal. <laughs> um, so other, so ways to train. Um, we, so for me in California, I and some of my teammates, we seek out the local volleyball pits and they're around, they're everywhere. So 
I am, I don't have a pit in my backyard. I have a little bit of grass, um, but I go out to the local sand pits. And so I've got a pit that's like five minutes from my house. I go out there roughly four days a week and I just work on basic skills. But for teams that are, don't have access to the beaches or, or, um, uh, or sand pits, let's say, and they want to prepare for a tournament like Virginia Beach, there are any basic drills, resistance type style. Um, Lou is my teammate that I, this is why I went down the path. <laughs> I haven't had enough coffee today, clearly. Um, Lou is my NorCal teammate that I, I'm like, hey, I, I'm not quick on my transitions or I, you know, in the sand you, you get that resistance training. Like how can I do things that's not in the sand that'll continue to help grow me. And so she's got a, an array of tools in her toolkit that she provides me as a player. So that, that would be probably best for you to share. Yeah. So a couple of things. So first of all, um, Fred, thank you so much for your question. Thanks for being on the panel. Um, so we're happy to have you. Uh, one of the things that well, there, there's a couple of things. If you don't have access to like a sand pit, like Janae was saying, or like even the beach, um, there are ways to get creative. So one of the things that like I remember doing was, um, so sand obviously beach soccer is created with like, you don't have any shin guards, you don't have any socks. So something that you could do that could be a fun practice for your team to get ready is, um, barefoot training. So have them one day come on the field, you know, hmm. barefoot training. And what you're working on is on that grass, the grass will automatically, when you sit the ball on the grass, not when you smash it down, it kind of sits up a little bit, just enough to get the players to get their toes under that ball. And what you can do is work on your flicks, flicks to thigh, and then you're juggling. So a lot of the beach hmm. soccer game, as you know, as you've experienced, as you've seen in tournaments is getting to have the ball in the air and transitioning the ball into the air. So obviously the ki the kids will need to be learning um, aerial skills or juggling a better first touch out of the air, that kind of thing. Um, so getting the ball on the ground, flicking it up to a teammate, um, juggling, having it just make it fun, barefoot, that kind of thing, getting them prepped that kind of way um, brings in a little bit of a, of a challenge. It won't be able to mimic the, the full on sand, but at least you'll be better prepared than having shoes on. Um, and then all those bulky shin guards where we're trying to do some of the exercises. Uh, one of the other thing too, that um, I'm just going to go ahead and, and wiggle that in there too, is I created a beach, uh, a juggling program. So there's a, a regular version of it and there's a beach soccer version of it. And this is a bilateral, bilateral systematic approach to juggling. Janae's done it. I've done it. A couple of players on NorCal have done it. Uh, Kira, one of our teammates have done it as well. She had really good feedback, which was kind of fun, but but essentially the program is designed to give players um, 12,210 juggles if they make no mistakes at all. But you start with the ball on the ground and the juggling technique is you're flicking to your thigh in order to be able to gain some movement forward, to gain some grounds, and then obviously passing the ball, that kind of thing. So those are all, there's, there's little programs in place. I have one, uh, there's other great content out there, but I would just like creativity. And if you wanna reach out to me, I'd be happy to like, blast out some ideas and, you know, you and I can maybe collaborate on how to make um, that team, you know, your team a little bit better, more comfortable um, prepping for the Virginia tournament. So, but yeah, thank you so much for your question. Appreciate it. Yeah. I, I just want to add a few more. And because I was like, looking back at Fred's question, I was like, you know, it's, it, it goes into like, how do we keep this sport alive? Mm -hmm. And in many, and other sports too. I mean, um, we got a chance to go the U S national team. We got a chance to go to Qatar and play in uh, the Anak World Beach Games. It, it, it's an Olympic event, um, but we were there with other sports. We were there not only with beach volleyball, we were there with skateboarding, we were there with rock climbing, we were there with other, all the other water sports um, that aren't recognized at a large scale of like the official Olympics, but we were also there with um, beach handball. And there are so many different sports that aren't really uh, showcase as much, right? Not much awareness. So to go back to the question of like, how do we keep this sport alive? We, we as coaches, we as players have to continue to educate our youth. We can't just go and focus on ourselves as players. So for me, it'd be easy enough for me just to say, no, I just train on my own and, and I do my thing because I'm competing for that jersey that I want to wear with the crest. Mm -hmm. That would be super easy for a player to do. But in order to keep this sport competitive, you have to continue to grow people, whether they're grown up uh, teenagers or in college, but mainly the youth. 
if we can develop the youth and open up and give them the chance to train in the sand, to train, you know, even if it's futsal too, but we just have to give them the opportunity. And it doesn't have to be a, a well thought out training program either. You could literally take your team into a sand pit and just say, we're just going to dribble. We're just going to juggle. We're going to do a juggle circle, getting their feet in there. Um, a lot of times I go to the turf or grass and I go barefoot. Like Lou mentioned it earlier. I was like, yeah, I do that all the time. I'm barefoot most of the time when I train, when I juggle, uh, when I lift weights. And so a lot of it is taking it to different uh, platforms. So shoes off, let's go. So I love that, that you brought that up, Lou. Um, we have uh, Warren who wants to know if uh, there's websites or place coaches can go to find sessions for practices or fun activities. So obviously I want you both to share <laughs> uh, pyramids uh, for juggling and any of your uh, go-tos that you that you look to, um, that would be great. Um, and as I've been listening to you guys, I'm wondering, is there differences for men and boys in the sport um, compared to women and girls? Or is it kind of just, the sport is growing and it's kind of hopefully growing on an equal playing field for both um, genders or all genders. So, so I can say for, sorry, Lou, you wanna go? Well, I was just gonna say it's barely, there's just like one team based out of Toronto in Canada. Um, and then it's a men's team. There's no women's team in Canada mm. for us. So it's not growing as much. So that question will probably have to, you know, they are, they're called um, the Canadian um, beach soccer team but it's not there they were at one point i think a national team and now they're no longer um but it, the, the sport is very slow growing in canada um unfortunately but yeah yeah for so there's uh canada is a very unique <laughs> situation because there's no women women's team there but yeah. lou's gonna be the first they're telling you they're gonna have a national team they have to have a national team this oh, is God. the biggest thing about this sport is in order to keep this sport alive, other than bringing awareness and educating and starting to just dabble in the sport, um, we have to have leagues, you know? We have to have leagues to play in. Um, so in the men's and, and boys side, mainly the men's, there's leagues in, in Europe and it's, it's a heavy, it's a, it's a big sport in Europe. Mm -hmm. you, you, go to, you go to Portugal, Spain, you go to Poland, Russia, they, they have leagues and they play. And there's more consistency. And then there that brings their youth and they do these youth academies. And so I think United States is just, uh, you know, and, and Canada is just a little bit behind the curve in some of this uh, area, especially with beach soccer. But now that we have a U.S. national team, you know, other other nations will come around. Um, I want to say El Salvador, I think, was the first time that they put a U.S. national team together. So El Salvador has one. Um there's a few other teams that I'm blanking on right now, but there's a few other countries that have a national team now. And so the more nations that come on board, the bigger the sport grows, especially in the women's side. Right. The women's side is way behind, way behind. I will say this for the national team. For you, with U.S. soccer, they're striving for equality. They're striving for we're going to give the men's team their training camps. We're also going to give the women's team their training camps. The first experience we had as a, as um, as a U.S. national team right out the gates was playing in El Salvador. It was a very last minute, let's go, let's get a team together. We got invited. We were the, it was our first showing. We had a, a really quick training. We had no training camp and we played the best we could not knowing each other, not knowing each other's style. So you have to prepare a team to compete if you want them to do well. And I think U.S. soccer is, is, has realized that. And I think they're doing an awesome job with ensuring that the women have what they need to be prepared to compete at a high level because the women's side for beach soccer, you go against Brazil, you go against Russia, you go against Spain, they're up there. Mm -hmm. You watch any, you go on YouTube and watch any of those countries play, their level is pff, because they, they were raised that way. They were raised plain beach they they're young they're out there in the sand that you go to any beach in portugal they have goals in their sand on their beaches you come to california we have volleyball nets <laughs> on our beaches which is great but 
we, you know, we could do better for the sport. So it must be hard then at this point to get sponsors or is it kind of a free for all now that sponsors can get in on the beginning and really help build the sport? I, I think, I think it could go either way. I think, you know, for us soccer, it's one thing cause there's already established sponsorship right. sponsorships, but now you know, you've got the women's grass team that did so well, you know, that sheds a really great light and opportunity for beach national team. But it's also, like I said earlier, it's also, you have to uphold that standard. And so I think a lot of sponsorships could, you know, potentially come, but for, for NorCal, you know, we've had a couple local sponsors. So we went local, we went to, to people we trusted, um, at the time there was footballer, um, they came right out the gates and they provided us our gear. They're like jerseys. We got you. Um, uh, uh, Golden State uh, Brewery. They also were another sponsor for NorCal. Again, uh, Louisa was good friends with the owner, but it's a local brewery and we wanted to support them and bring awareness to not only their business, but also to our sport. And so I think you, you'll start to see more organizations take that chance um, you know, maybe after the pandemic and things start to get better um, in our economy, you know, th- I think companies and businesses are starting to you know, take more chances and, and support these teams, you know, especially with the teams that want to be able to go and compete internationally. Because when you start to compete internationally, you, you go into any of the European, you know, countries and they're like, oh, U.S., they have a team now. Okay. Oh. <laughs> you know, um, you know, any of the other countries that they have a team now, Paraguay has a team, you know, so sponsorships, I think when the sport starts to grow now with the, the U S national team, you're going to see probably more sponsorships come through. Mm-hmm. That's great. We have a couple more minutes and, um, I'd love to hear from you both about what you hope for the future, both for yourself in the sport and what you would love to see for women and girls, in general in soccer and I guess, you know, just, just looking forward to obviously 2021, hopefully it's a fresh start. And where do you see soccer going? Go for a low. <laughs> <laughs> where do I see soccer going? Oh man. I mean, I think. I just well, say 21 and I'm just like, oh, I, I know. Pay for you. Know. So close. I know. Um, one of the, I mean, Honestly speaking, as we, as we keep growing the sport, I just want it to keep growing. It's something I'm passionate about and I love. So I would love for anybody that would want to play at a higher level or not necessarily at a higher level, but in different avenues, there's tech ball, there's football, there's all these other um, different avenues of soccer. That's not just limited to grass that we can keep promoting and keep um, shedding awareness on so that these players can remain in the game. So the more players that play the game, we all benefit. So what I would like to see in the future is just like an increase of awareness and increase of exposure to all these different avenues. And, um, you know, having like, like if you're a soccer player and you meet somebody, oh, you're a soccer player, it's an automatic, it's a common bond. It's a universal language. It's played in all these countries across the world, right? And for America and Canada to have, have it keep growing and growing and growing, we're just catching up with the rest of the world, which that's what we want to do. It's a universal language. Let's keep growing the sport and having fun with it because for me, one of the things that I would love, love to see is more, more females, of course, as we're talking on this conference, to play that can be empowered through the sport. That would be one of my dreams. And um, obviously anybody that plays would be great, but having more female, young female athletes being empowered and you know, doing great things throughout the sport and using the sport as a medium to like learn life lessons. Yeah. Well said, we'll end there. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <Drop the> <laughs> <mic>. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I feel really fortunate in, you know, I'm, I hate saying that I, I'm an older player, but I kind of am clearly I'm uh, the, you know, you always hear in any sport you're in. And I don't know if it's, if it's like this for the, for the men's side, and I'm not trying to play the gender card here in any way, but I will say as a female, cause that's the gender I know. <laughs> um, I just know that I, what I heard a lot for me was, you know, uh, you're short, you're too short, you know, you're, you know, you, all of us hear something negative, uh, you know, through our journey and it's whether you choose to listen and believe it or not. Like, yeah, of course I believed it when they said I'm short, (laughs) but 
but that didn't, that didn't stop me. It stopped me from playing basketball for sure, right off the bat, but it didn't stop me from pursuing the sport that I genuinely, genuinely loved. And when it comes to uh, age, I started to hear this actually in beach soccer more than anything. People are like, oh, you're not going to age out until this. I'm like, age out? Like, don't say that because <laughs> I am, I guess, considered an older player. But to watch the women's grass national team play, and I think there's like 44, 45 year olds. I'm not in the 40s yet. I want to give myself that space right now. But um, I, I think we have to stop doing that to ourselves and to players, to, like, to young, especially young players, because they have all of these hopes and dreams and maybe some of them don't, but when we put limitations on them right now and don't give them a path to, if they can correct. Um, and what we hear a lot actually is we hear a lot about, uh, you know, you don't get play time. So, you know, and I had this experience actually in college, you know, you don't get play time and you can choose to like, just sit and pout on the bench and just be like, I'm not getting play time, lose playing more than me and just be mad about it. Or you can, you can sit and absorb and watch and talk to your coaches if they're willing to talk and, and to coaches out there, talk to your players, because one thing, a player, it eats you up when you don't know why you're not playing, when you don't understand truly why am I not getting playing time? Why is this person playing more than me? Um, the conversations have to be there to help foster the growth in the players. It, it has to be there. Otherwise, you're going to leave these players just like mustering and trying to figure it out. I have players playing professional that don't get play time. And they're like, ah, oh, it's because someone beat me out in that one position. It's like, well, as players, be the utility player. Don't be the one. Don't just fit that one position strive for more, strive for different sports, strive for different positions. It's not saying I give up on this position because someone beat me out. It's just to say, I want to have more tools in my tool belt. Um, and it's something that Francis Farberoff, our coach, the U.S. national team does really, really well is he, he talks to the players about you as an individual player. And he's not comparing you to other players. He's telling you what you're so good at and how we can continue to evolve you as a player to be more than what you are good at. And so that's what I hope for for future. I hope that we can continue to grow our youth because the youth is going to carry these sports further and further and be able to compete at the national level, it, level in the Olympics, you know, in the World mm -hmm. Cup. So that's what I hope for. Yeah. You both are so phenomenal. I mean, <laughs> I have never really thought about beach soccer, but I really actually want to go out there right now yeah. and just kick the ball. I mean, I don't even know if I could lift it up off the sand. I'm going to have to do your pyramid program. Um, <laughs> but I want to throw in a hope that I have that I would love to see um, a Canadian um, women's national Yay! team. Yes. And, My um, life would just be so complete. <laughs> Oh gosh. I would love to see it on, see you um, on the team, Lou. Thank and you. Um, I think that would be great. And I cannot think of a better way to have started this summit than with you two ladies. Um, you are phenomenal. Um, I am, I'm so inspired right now. I'm kind of getting used to <laughs> I'm just like, God, I want to, I, and I want to go play. And um so I want to thank you both so much for joining us today. And I want to thank um, everyone who's out in the audience listening and um, come back for more sessions. Um, just so you know, goal five is providing a giveaway for every single session. So somebody's going to win some really cool product from a fabulously owned female company. And um, we have some great sessions coming up the rest of today and next week. And Lou, Janae, any parting words you'd like to share with us? Um, any websites, contact information, anything you want to share, we will definitely put up um, on your speaker dashboard so people can get in touch with you. You guys are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I, I want to uh, thank you. Thank you, Alicia. And thank you, Lou, for this opportunity. It's always, it's always really cool to talk about the sport that you love so much. You know, I thought it was just soccer that I love, but it is. It's soccer and other forms of it. Um, so I want to thank you, Alicia. Uh, and Lou, my buddy, my teammate, I want to thank you as well. <laughs> this great, amazing opportunity. Um, I also want to thank, you know, all of the, 
the people, even if I didn't mention you in my journey that have, um, you know, that I've grown and learned from and have brought me into the sport and, and my teammates, because I think all of those people in that journey play a really key role um, for me in where I'm at today, you know, um, the, as far as like where to go, I would say go on social media, fo definitely follow Lou and I, um, follow our teammates. Cause I have some really, uh, great teammates that have their own academies. Uh, I mentioned gamer beach and also Cali beach. Um, and then you've got a lot of great resources, pro AM tag O'Sullivan's really great resource for education. Um, but connect on social media because we can, we can connect you with, um, with other uh, programs and people. And then also out to the colleges, I think we need to, you know, get beach soccer, at least training involved with the women's and men's side, because it will improve their game. It will improve so many on so many levels and no one else is doing that other than the European. That's all they play. So that's my, my last plug. <laughs> well, I want to say, yeah, I want to say thank you so much for having us, Alicia. It was such a privilege. And I want to thank America Scores as well for, you know, hosting this and hosting this amazing conference and wanting to do like, you know, putting some awesome seeds in the community to just kind of help everybody in this during this time. Um, so I really wanted to thank you guys. And I want to thank everybody that's on the panel. Um, those of us that we know that we don't know and, and listen, like we're here, we're human. We want to hear from you. Um, so really, truly, if you have any questions, reach out to us. We would love, love, love to hear from you and to answer your questions and just open a discussion and collaboration because um, you know, it would be my pleasure, you know, to just kind of chat about like what your session could look like and how we can brainstorm and all those other things. I mean, let's keep growing the community together for me. So, and Jay, it's been an honor speaking with you. I mean, if it wasn't for you and, you know, a few others, I definitely would not be in the sport um, because she had asked yeah, you me, no, you, 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 no. <laughs> she, she, you know, for a long time, she's like, yeah, she's like, come, come on, play with us. I'm like, yeah, I don't know. It's like, come on, play with us. I'm like, I don't know. Finally, she convinced me, you know, but, um, you know, if it wasn't for you and a few others, like Luisa and all of them, I don't know that I would be where I'm at today. So shout out to our team, NorCal team. We miss you guys and can't wait to NorCal. be able to compete. Um, and I, again, thank you so much for everybody and for all your time and for effort and putting effort and putting, putting effort in all of this. <laughs> <laughs> Lou, I'm sorry. I just, one final thought. You just yeah. made me think of something you need to build in your dad, because obviously he knows what he's doing with yeah. sand an indoor beach. Oh God. Up in, in New Brunswick, yes. get it going, get some yes. franchises out there indoor beach soccer that'd be phenomenal and that would definitely be phenomenal 100 percent. yes yep start some leagues up and then yeah we need an indoor warehouse indoor warehouse yes, land indoor warehouse. yes i'm gonna start <laughs> look at real estate guys <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys so much um everyone please stay safe and healthy and have a happy holidays that are coming up a new year fresh start for everyone hopefully and come back for more sessions Awesome. Thank you both so much. Bye, guys. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye.